Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we begin today the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So the 13th chapter, what was it about broadly? Gyan. So there are six questions that were asked. Kshetra, Kshetra, Gya, Gyana, Gya and Prakriti and Purusha. Excellent. So when this was discussed, what was the underlying question below these questions that Arjuna had? Yeah. Yes. He wanted to have the world view of, of Jnana, the philosophical world view, explained or reconciled with the Bhakti world view that Krishna is giving. So, sometimes when a question is asked, when a question is asked and question is to be answered, we can answer either the content of the question or we can look and try to understand the intent of the question also. So, answering the content is good, but if you can understand the intent, and answer that, that is by far the best. So that is what Krishna is going to do. And a central element of the Sankhya, the Jnana worldview that is there, uh, which is being discussed, a central element of this is the Gunas, the three modes of material nature. So Krishna will talk about these three modes elaborately in this particular chapter. So let's look at the three modes and how Krishna introduces them. So Krishna, this is in 14th chapter, 5th verse. He gives the list of the three modes, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Iti, these three. Gunaha, these are three modes. Prakriti, Sambhavaha, that they are born of material nature. Sattvam Rajas Tama Iti Sattvam Rajas Tama Iti Guna Prakriti Sambhavaha Guna Prakriti Sambhavaha <coughs> What do they do? Nibad Nanti They bind And there are many places where Krishna addresses Arjuna as Mahabaho Now Mahabaho, what does it literally mean? Mighty arm Mighty arm, powerful so, in one sense, it's just an appreciation. It's a respectful reference, acknowledging Arjuna's position. Simultaneously, Krishna sometimes uses it to convey that although you are Mahabaho, still this truth, this reality I'm going to talk about is much more powerful. So, here, Nibadnanti Mahabaho. There's a strong contrast in these two words. Bound everyone is, oh mighty armed one. So, <laughs> so, the implication is that you may be mighty armed, but still you are also bound. So, and he, Krishna doesn't say specifically you are bound. He says, every embodied being, dehe dehinam, every embodied being, every soul is bound to the body, avvayam, since time immemorial. Nibad Nanti Mahabaho Nibad Nanti Mahabaho Dehe Dehi Namavyayam Dehe Dehi Namavyayam So here, the idea is, let's recite this once again together. Sattvam Rajasthama Iti Guna Prakriti Sambhava Nibad Nanti Mahabaho Dehe Dehi Namavyayam so let's begin first by understanding the concept of the modes. Then we'll move towards understanding each of the modes. Hmm. So now the modes, the most common metaphor used for it or theme uses ropes. And that is conveyed here also through the idea of bound. So what, sorry. So what exactly are the the modes? We can say that they are, if this is the soul and 
this is the world of matter. Now from the soul, consciousness comes out. So the modes are like subtle forces. The modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. I will repeat this. Say for example, there is a sattva. So we can say in this material world, the higher part is the sattva part. So sattva is one rope. Then you could say, say rajas is another rope. And then tamas is a third root. So, these are three ropes that are constantly existing. Dehe, mm -hmm. Dehinam. So, they, you can say it binds the soul to the body or it binds spirit broadly to matter. So, now these three ropes are constantly there, but sometimes one rope is much stronger than another rope and then when that rope is stronger say imagine if a prisoner is tied by three ropes to three soldiers or guards and all three are dragging now, if all three are dragging in the same direction then the prisoner will be dragged in the straight, say, so in that same direction but if all three are pulling in different directions, then whichever direction is the pull is strongest, that is where the person will go. <coughs> so, now the soul is pure. The soul is not affected by the modes. What is affected is the soul's consciousness. So, the soul's consciousness based on the influence of the modes. Say for example, if we go to college. Now, imagine there are three students. <laughs> Say one is in Sattvaguna, one is in Rajoguna, third is in Tamaguna. So they may come to the same college gate. And the student Sattvaguna may feel a pull towards the library. Okay, now I come here to study, I have to get this book, let me get this book and start studying. Mm -hmm. uh, the student Rajoguna uh, may fill a pool towards the canteen, towards the mess. Hey, there I can meet some friends. Uh, maybe I can hang out with people, I can have some fun over there. Mm -hmm. The student Tamoguna, you know, maybe in the college there is some secret place where you know, people smoke or people drink, even if it's illegal, maybe people share drugs. So that person will pull, feel a pull to go in that direction. So in one sense, the college is the same, but different people will feel pull in different directions. So we could say, this is the influence of the modes. So what are the modes? They are subtle forces. Hmm. Broadly speaking, they are subtle psychological forces that shape the interaction. They shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. So, our consciousness can go towards various aspects of matter. But which aspect will it go towards? Say right now, if you are in Sattva Guna, then you may be very interested in this subject. Okay, This is something which I always wanted to understand. Let's see if I can get a better understanding. So if your mind is in Raju Guna, you may feel, I, I wonder what is there for uh, the meal today evening. I hope it's something tasty. I really want to eat something enjoyable. 
if your mind is tamogona it's been a long day how long will this class go <laughs> i just want to go to sleep now hmm? so now all three are in one sense perfectly understandable reactions now it's important to know that none of the modes is intrinsically bad that we may say rajas or tamas is bad no see the three modes are part of nature and tamas is also necessary for us to be able to sleep and rest say for example for some people their bed is like a magical place as soon as they get into the bed they remember all the things throughout the day that they, they did not do and then their mind starts going on hyperdrive they just can't sleep now if that happens that's not very helpful isn't it so when we are in bed and we want to sleep then getting tamas is good and if tamas doesn't come it's a problem so so these three modes they are forces that act on our consciousness and they bind us in different ways now of course while we can say that all three modes have their role that does not necessarily mean all three modes are equally important or equally beneficial each mode has its role so broadly speaking sattva is associated with clarity sattvat sanjayate gyanam so when we are sattva guna we think calmly we try to get a clear understanding of things we plan now when we talk about sattva guna as i said they are psychological forces but this these modes are associated with both externals and internals that means certain objects may be associated with particular modes and certain minds may be associated with particular modes like some people's mind may habitually be in tamoguna and that's why throughout the day the thing that they look forward to is escapism whether it is just by sleeping or just mindless entertainment or drugs or some kind of escapism that's what they are constantly seeking some people are expert at doing things some people are expert at coming up for ex with excuses for not doing things <laughs> so that may be tamasic so it's associated with externals and internals so sattva is associated with clarity rajas is associated with activity quite often it can be hyper activity also that in rajas a person just cannot sit peacefully they have to do something sitting and thinking it is required but they just don't feel its value come on enough let's move on for let's more do things generally tamas is associated with lethargy so in sattva things are happening let's figure out how things are happening let's figure out why things are happening that's the mood in sattva we try to get clarity in rajoguna things are happening i have to make them happen my way i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that i have to bend the world to my will so in general sattva seeks understanding hmm? clarity is associated with understanding rajas seeks control when we are rajoguna we our primary thing is we have to control things and tamas seeks escapism that oh things are happening they will keep happening who bothers i just want to go into my own world and escape and enjoy <coughs> so now 
many times the word also used is escapist entertainment you heard this when movies come up hey, it is good escapist entertainment you can just escape from the world for some time now generally we associate tamas with distraction or rajas with distraction what do you think well it depends that uh, each of these modes generally sattva will be associated with concentration we are able to focus concentration that will gradually go towards absorption so concentration is more effortful absorption is more effortless now but the point is this is for the purpose of understanding now the same two can be there in rajoguna also but their purpose is different is control sometimes people who are materialistic they can work very hard a they have project deadline they may forget about food they may forget about sleeping and they can just work for hours and hours and hours that can also give control sorry that cannot they cannot rajoguna can also give absorption but that is for the purpose of enjoyment now of course rajoguna can also have distraction that means when the rajoguna is too much then what happens is hey i want to do this also i want to do that also i want to do that also there are too many things to go on now quite often tamoguna is associated with passive attention now what do you mean by passive attention see generally we consider attention to be a good thing and if you see if somebody is watching a movie people are fully attentive isn't it that in fact the whole movie environment is generally arranged so that there can be maximum attention if you go nowadays people can watch movies in their homes on their phones or in their gadgets but still people pay a significant amount to go to theaters why because if the purpose of movie the movie is escapism then they want the environment that will help them to escape the best so in the theater what happens is one set of lights turns off and other set of light turns on so you forget everything so there are two shaktis of maya one is the avarnatmika shakti and the other is a prakshepatmika shakti <laughs> so avarnatmika means just cover everything else prakshepatmika is throw or pull in the direction so now in a sense when people are watching movies they are completely immersed but this is often without the brain working much this passively consuming content and quite often especially say now when people get hooked to social media and just say okay watch one reel and another and another and another just keep watching them as for hours and then after that okay what did you watch what did i watch it's like the mind has become so numbed and dumbed that we don't even remember what we are watching so actually passive attention it is not healthy so you know when we want when we talk about there is a concept of attention regulation attention regulation means is a person able to focus so one extreme in attention regulation is distraction where the mind is going here there and everywhere and the person just is not able to focus on any one thing but the other extreme is obsession or fixation so that means sometimes people's attention gets caught in one thing and that getting caught in one thing is unhealthy because they become completely oblivious of their environment which is not intentional so when we are fixated on something then what happens is that we get caught and we don't even realize we are caught so then we can call it distraction like say somebody is driving a car and they are also watching a movie on their phone it's a dangerous thing to do 
and on top of that you get so caught in watching the movie that you don't even know what's the traffic hmm? then everybody has to watch to get out of their way is it that's extremely dangerous so distraction could be that we we are just our mind is running here there and everywhere but fixation means it is going somewhere where we don't want it to we are not even aware that it is gone there and it's lost over there now in between the best thing with attention regulation is it's like intentional focus so this is more like active attention so this is what we are seeking and this is often one significant difference between uh, reading books and watching tv or watching movies whatever what happens in in movies or tv the world is created for us and we just passively consume it but even if somebody is reading a novel then what happens is the words are there and our brain and mind have to work to create the world in our imagination so that's why it's more work required and that's why people don't want to do it so much but quite often people's intelligence you know the iq and all that gets stunted when too much tv is watched that's why it's called a idiot box isn't it so what happens is the intelligence gets stultified so so the point i'm making over here is that we are trying to illustrate how the modes work in terms of our common experiences so now we could say i i'll conclude this point i say that modes are both external and internal so external means like i gave two examples of two mediums one is reading books that will generally put a person in sattva guna isn't it if you have to read a book especially that's not just just like a maybe a gossip magazine or just some romance novel or action novel uh, it's something which requires some effort that will put a person in sattva guna on the other hand a person just watching movie now you we sometimes somebody can watch uh, there are movies with some philosophical themes also but you know they are maybe like maybe 0.1% of all the movies that are there <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so most of the movies is like this passive so there are externals which are associated with certain modes and similarly there are people the mind is also shaped in some ways at some people their mind is such that they would prefer books to movies like sometimes there are some popular books and they are made into movies now far more people will watch the movie based on the book than the book itself but there are some people who prefer the book they are rare and generally people in sattva are relatively rare then there are people in tamas they would just maybe prefer the movies and they would not and prefer tv they will also not prefer any kind of educational tv they say i don't watch so i i saw our cartoon you know two people are there one is like a very intellectual young boy and his sister is there who is like just a fun loving person say this so this boy is saying you know i want to watch discovery channel there's so much you can learn and the girl is saying it's tv it's not learning time <laughs> <laughs> you're not meant to learn anything you're just meant to enjoy so the point is that different people's minds can also be different so the modes are associated with both externals and internals and we become habituated to functioning in particular ways based on the modes so this is i'll give some metaphors to illustrate the idea of the modes and then we'll move forward to explain how krishna analyzes the modes so one metaphor i use is what is the metaphor just now already used ropes so ropes they comprise convey the idea that it's we are being pulled so you could say the ropes act on the objects the ropes act on the minds also so some minds naturally seek out some objects and some objects pull some minds we'll see in our own life sometimes sometimes some sense objects just come towards us without our will and sometimes our senses go out seeking sense objects so it works both ways so modes are ropes but another understanding the modes is the modes are 
like colors. Now Krishna says, Daiviya Esha Gunamai. So he says, Mama Maya Duratya. So he says, this material world is made of the modes. So what does it mean if you consider the idea of colors? Specifically, you can, if you want to use a digital medium, there are pixels. Now the pixels are only of three colors. But from that, all images and videos come in the digital world. So similarly, all the vishaya from the guna, from the modes, all the vishaya. What does vishaya mean? Yes, it doesn't mean subjects. Here it means sense objects. Vishaya can mean konsa vishaya pad rahe ho Wo vishaya nahi chal raha hai. That is what the subject we discuss. So, from the modes, all the sense objects emerge. So, in one sense, in this sense, the modes are basically building blocks of material existence. Building blocks specifically of mat material manifestations. Just like the pixels are the building blocks of everything that appears on a TV. So, they are the modes are colors. Mm -hmm. Now, generally speaking, the concept is subtle and we'll use different metaphors to try to point toward them. Now, another metaphor that can be used is see, that they are like gears. You know, when there's a gears in a vehicle, if a person has put the car in a particular gear, then naturally it will move in that, that way. So, like that, our body-mind machine it can operate in different gears and once it goes in a particular gear that's how it will start functioning so for example in the middle of the day we might be more in rajoguna and at that time suddenly somebody stops us you know our mind is there i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that and then somebody says suddenly calls us and says hey let's have a philosophical discussion why our mind is here you know, you don't have any work to do. I don't have the time for this right now. So now, maybe when we are going to Guna, at that time, it's easier to do it. Now, of course, a car's gear can be changed. But when the car is in a particular gear, there is a momentum associated with that gear. Hmm? And shifting that momentum takes time. So gears, the idea is associated with two things. That there is a motion. And not just motion, there is momentum. So, when we are in a particular mode, moving onward in that mode is easier. Shifting modes is difficult. So, the modes are gears and these gears, in one sense, we could say, the gears <coughs> change. There is natural change and there is intentional change. The natural change means generally it is said that the early morning times they are broadly in Sattva Guna. Now the timings may be whatever 5 to 11, 1 whatever. 8 hours are uh, 3 to 11 whatever it depends on certain differences, certain differences when the Brahma Murta is there and all that. But certain timings it's almost like during those timings the body, the nature is in a particular mode and our body-mind machine also goes into that particular mode. So there's natural, you could say the morning is sattva. And then like that, daytime is rajas and nighttime is tamas. So this is a broad understanding of the natural change of modes. But then it is also possible that it can be intentionally changed. Now, intentional can be you know, say conscious present intention or it can be in, in the broad Vedic tradition there is Prakriti and there is Vikruti. That the Prakriti can get distorted. So, for example, if somebody has been habituated to stay awake late at night and they study late at night. Now, it can happen that for them waking up in the morning is extremely difficult. 
and then for them the activity of studying might be easier at night so when i say intentional it could be present intention it could be past habit the person didn't have the so it's present choice or present determination so it is possible that some people may have a vikruti so their their particular modes may be different in the sense that which mode influences them when may vary so this is where when krishna talks about the modes he says that the modes are in competition with each other let's look at this so rajas tamas cha abhibhuya cha abhibhuya means overcoming subordinating so subordinating these modes satvam bhavati bharata o bharata o arjuna satvam sometimes satva sometimes becomes prominent rajas tamas cha abhibhuya rajas tamas cha abhibhuya satvam bhavati bharata satvam bhavati bharata and then he says raja satvam that raja and sattva are sometimes subordinated and tamas chaiva tama becomes sorry raja it becomes dominant and then that it subordinates sattva and tamas chaiva and then tama becomes prominent and it subordinates sattva and rajas so raja sattvam tamas chaiva raja sattvam tamas chaiva tama sattvam rajas tatha tama sattvam rajas tatha so these modes are constantly pulling say for example as a student uh, even if somebody is a student is not a at all spiritually inclined but even as a student there might be a pull that might pull in two different directions now i want to be an achiever that means i want to study i don't want to get distracted but then the other part of me which wants to be an enjoyer hey college is a time to enjoy everybody is party you know what is all this i just constantly studying 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 i want to enjoy hmm? Hmm. so there is this pull between us within us so maybe one pull is coming from satva guna another pull is coming from rajo guna it's possible that sometimes both pulls might also come from rajo guna because see each of these modes is made of ropes and sometimes the person can have two rajasic desires so sometimes you know a, a person can think in rajoguna also a bit long term like there <laughs> so the modes ultimately are determined not so much by the action that we are doing but by the intention the motivation the purpose for which we are doing those actions so hiranyakashipu was performing tapasya and normally we could we would consider tapasya as sattvic but was this tapasya sattvic no it was intended for destroying lord vishnu it was interested in, it was intended for destroying the world destroying all dharma in the world so that is a destructive intent that is tamasic so in general we, we now we could say wanting to be achiever could be sattva watching to uh, wanting uh, we enjoy it if it's escape to enjoyment that could be tamas but it's also possible that a uh, wanting to be enjoyer can be rajas but wanting an achi wanting to be an achiever can also be rajas you know i want to go to this party and I, and i'll find a girlfriend i'll enjoy with that or somebody say you know okay if i study then i can get a good job then i can get a more attractive partner so that may also be rajas equally so some people may say i want to eat and enjoy somebody say i'll follow a strict diet i'll not eat so that i can be fit and attractive and then i'll enjoy <laughs> <laughs> so basically the idea is that these modes they uh, can pull us in different directions and sometimes the same mode can also pull us in different directions or because two different strands in the same modes so for example immediate enjoyment immediate mental enjoyment would be rajas mixed with tamas and it a little long term material enjoyment that is rajas mixed with sattva i still want material enjoyment but it is slightly different so this is long term material enjoyment so this is rajas with some sattva and then 
if somebody wants to tamas would be or rather there is short term material enjoyment i want to enjoy right now hmm. there is rajas but there is also some tamas so it's amazing we might consider say an activity like drinking to be tamasic but even an activity like drinking which is tamasic can be mixed with some rajas and even some sattva is how is that possible that say you know if a, a group of kids go in a car this happens in the western world that say if six kids are going in a part party to drink then they all take turns and they decide that you know in today's party it is your turn to do tapasya you will not touch a drink because you are going to drive us back after the party so to this party you do tapasya next party i'll do tapasya so they are drinking but they at least have that much awareness that after drinking i should not be driving and therefore because i am going to be driving i won't be drinking now sometimes somebody may drink and they want to drive and the bartender they say sir maybe i can call a cab for you oh dear yeah i can get along so <laughs> so they are so drunk that they are not even aware that they are drunk so so these modes have shades within them there can be completely dark tamoguna but there can tamasic activity which can also be with some regulation now when somebody is choosing not to drink that that consideration again can be hey, i don't want to lose my license because then how will i go out how will i enjoy so you could say that is rajasik but somebody may think you know by driving by drinking you know, i might hit someone there might be an accident i might kill someone i don't want to harm i want to enjoy but i don't want to harm anyone so the intention for the regulation could be rajasik the intention for the regulation could also be tam satvik isn't it so it depends the modes uh, are determined by not just the activity the activity does matter but the motivation with which one is doing the activity matters even more and all of us experience different pulls so now we can consider what do the modes actually do to us how do they pull us so broadly speaking at the level of the mind there are two things that happen there are emotions and there are desires now generally emotions are associated with the gyan indriyas that means when we perceive something we perceive something we feel some emotion hey that's beautiful that's terrible that's disgusting so we perceive certain things and we feel some emotions that could be shock that could be anger various kinds of emotions are there so emotions are generally something external we observe and then we feel some emotion and now the desires are generally associated with karma indriyas when there are desires we don't just pursue we don't perceive we pursue pursue means we seek something we chase something so the very idea of desire desiring means wanting something so if you see dhyayato vishayan pumsah sangas teshu pajayate sangat sanjayate kamah so when we contemplate hey sangas teshu pajayate that's nice that's nice that's a emotion sangat sanjayate kama i want it that's a desire so quite often these two are related when we perceive something we feel hey, that's nice and from that's nice i want it the next thing can come so emotions and desires are related no doubt but still they are different broadly in terms of their modality in terms of their direction so primarily the modes affect us at the psychological level by inducing emotions and desires within us and then they shape our activities thereafter so the modes are not the same as desires 
we could say as I said the modes are subtle forces and they awaken certain emotions within us and certain desires within us. So depending on the mode that a person is in. Say if there is a there is a Bharatanatyam dancer, if there is a female Bharatanatyam dancer. Now somebody in Sattva Guna and that person observes that dancer. That person may appreciate the expert expertise in dancing. That person may appreciate, oh, what is the story being depicted over here? That person may remember the story. That person may connect, try to connect the action of the story. And that the that the person dancing is a female, they'll be aware of that, but that will not be as important as what is being depicted. If Krishna Lila is being depicted, they'll remember Krishna Lila. But if somebody is Rajoguna, the same female dancer, you know, it is okay, and the dancing is nice, but the focus will be not on Krishna Lila, on the sensuality, hmm. on the sensual aspect, the physical aspect. Tamoguna, you know, forget what the dance says, what is being depicted. I am only interested in the sensual aspect, nothing else at all. So, what happens is the same object can be perceived differently. The same object can trigger different emotions. In one case, it may trigger thoughtfulness, it may trigger remembrance of Krishna. In another case, it may trigger craving, sensual craving. So, depending on the object, so it will be different. So, these are the modes. Now, Krishna does an interesting analysis of the modes in terms of how he goes about in the analysis. So, we could do a technical analysis, but my focus here will not be on the technical analysis, but I will just give a broad outline. I said the defining characteristic of each mode. Each mode is associated with a particular like clarity, activity, lethargy. Now Krishna also says that when these modes are competing among us, how can we determine which mode is becoming more dominant? So that he gives three characteristics, broadly speaking. There are three verses, each verse describes the characteristic of the consciousness wherein that particular mode has become dominant. So let's look at these. So what we are trying to do now is we want to understand the modes and also try to identify the modes within us. So Sarva Dwareshu Dehes. The body has many Dwaras. We discussed the Navadware Pure Dehi today morning. So now Prakash Upajayate. When there is light in all the doors of the body. Now what does that mean? Is it that some light comes on the person's ears? <laughs> light comes on the person's nostrils? <laughs> no. See, the Gita is poetry. And there are many places when the Gita uses poetic language, metaphorical language. So, when there is light, say for example, we are in this room, and say, the whole room is dark and the area of the door also is dark. Then what will happen? Who is coming in? Who is going out? We will not even notice it. But if there is, it's properly lit, then we'll notice who is coming in, who is going out. And then we can choose, hey, this person, I don't want them to come in. Then we'll just go at the door and we'll maybe hey, hey, tell them, you know, we need to leave right now. Or somebody might just go forward and welcome them. So basically, when it is said that all the doors of the senses are illuminated, that means we are aware of what is coming into our senses and what is going out of our senses. We are aware and we choose it. You remember the modes influence our emotions and they influence our desires. So, what are the emotions am I feeling? Are these healthy emotions? Are these unhealthy emotions? What kind of desires am I pursuing? Is this healthy or unhealthy? So, there is Prakash at the doors of the senses. Jnanam Yada. So, when there is, what is the Prakash? The Prakash of knowledge. At the time when there is Jnana, Tada Vidya. Vidya means at that time, Arjuna, you should understand what has happened. Vivruddham, vivrudd, like Samruddhi means prosperity. So, Vivruddham means it has grown, it is prominent. Sattvam Ityuta, that is the time when the mode of Sattva is prominent. 
So let's recite this once. Sarvadware shude hesmin. Sarvadware shude hesmin. Prakash upajayate. Prakash upajayate. Gyanam yada tada vidya. Gyanam yada tada vidya. Vivruddham sattva mityuta. Vivruddham sattva mityuta. So, so here, when say imagine we are watching TV. Now we are aware. What am I watching? Is this wasting my time? Am I learning something valuable from it? And say there is prakash. It's, even if we are reading new some news, we are reading some book. We are talking with someone. Sometimes we just get caught in talking. Maybe this talk starts constructively, but after that, that person starts gossiping, and we get carried away in gossiping. Then it goes into prajnana. So we are aware of that. Hey, now it's becoming gossip. Better I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to. So then they go away. So we are when we are aware of what is happening with our senses, that awareness. So that is an indication sattva guna. So that is an indication sattva guna is rising within us. Now after describing this, basically the key point. of sattva guna is awareness now it's not just awareness that awareness of course is followed by action action in terms of choice mm. let's put it to say mm. that awareness leads to intelligent action or intelligent choosing what is it that i want to come in my eyes there are these three monkeys all of us have seen those isn't it don't don't see bad don't speak bad don't hear bad bura mat suno bura mat dekho bura mat bolo so that is broadly something associated with sattva guna that we are selective we are careful about what we take in we are also careful about what we let out so we don't see nasty things we don't speak nasty words that is sattva guna so the so now when we many people talk about be present you now say they say be in the live in the present be aware of the moment the whole idea of mindfulness that is very common in today's world that is little more than sattva guna not much more it is sattva guna just become more aware aware of what is happening and we will come back to this theme towards the end of this chapter as we move forward so let's recite this verse once again sarvadware shudhe together sarvadware shudhe hesmin prakasha upajayate gyanam yada tada vidya viruddham sattva mityuta so okay regarding sanskrit pronunciation when it is i t i it will be iti when it is i t y i it is ityam it is not iti uta it's itya uta it the t is half and then y is there after that itya uta okay so now krishna del talks about rajoguna he says rajoguna is associated with lobha first thing i want more 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 lobha and then pravrutti rarambha pravrutti means we all have certain natural tendencies and that's fine but when there is greed then we keep doing new and new things today i think i like this i'll do this tomorrow i like that i do that and pravrutti rarambha we just keep doing new things in rajoguna a person is very good at starting things <laughs> but not very good at taking them to the finish pravrutti rarambha and then what is that karmana a person does a lot of activity associated with a shamah spruha so spruha desire is something which everyone has but a shamah insatiable desire that is unhealthy so it's like say we all want to eat food and nobody wants to eat food that is tasteless but if in sattva guna we eat tasty food and when our stomach is full santosh is satisfied but when the rajoguna is there then we want to eat and eat and eat so 
So when we, are, we start the meal, we are a human being. As the meal goes on, we become like a pig. <laughs> Eat more and more and more. So that spruha is natural, but this is ashamaha spruha, insatiable desire. And then when these are happening, rajasya etan jayante. No, Arjuna, that rajasya, that this is the, all these result when rajoguna has become vibhruddhe. Bharata Rishyabha. There is another name for Arjuna. Lobha Pravritti Rarambha Lobha Pravritti Rarambha Karma Nama Shamaha Spruha Karma Nama Shamaha Spruha Rajasya Tani Jayante Rajasya Tani Jayante Vivruddhe Bharata Rishyabha Vivruddhe Bharata Rishyabha So here, what Krishna is saying about Rajoguna it's basically, it starts with desire. There is desire, craving, this is lobha. And because there is lobha, then there is pravritti. Oh, I want to do more. Pravritti arambha. So, you know, I have one job. I'm getting this much money, but I'll take another job. You know, I, I'm doing this project, but I'll take another project because I want to impress people. You know, I want to grow very fast. If somebody starts exercising, you know, exercising is a good thing, but you know, there is a, there is something called exercise addiction. <laughs> you know, how can somebody be addicted to something like this? But you know, people is, they're so, they're so compulsively obsessed with either their figure or their biceps or whatever, that they just can't stop it. And too much of even a good thing like exercise can be bad. So, karma nama aramba, they just want to, okay, I've done some exercise. You know, one day I'll do, okay, instead, okay, I've never done exercise before, maybe do some 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But one day they will go and they will do 3 hours. They lift many, many weights. And the next day they become a weight that somebody else has to lift. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pravati Rarambha. That basically, Prabhupada Translate says, just keep starting new projects. <laughs> For more and more things. And then there is karmana. Karmana means because of that, there is work. Now work is good, but disproportionate, excessive work. Now there is a, generally, most addictions are disapproved of in society. But there is one addiction, not only just approved, but it is also glamorized. Do you know which is that addiction? Sorry? Work, yes. There is a word for it. Workaholic. So, when somebody is a workaholic, they just cannot live without working. Their work doesn't just become a part, their means of livelihood. That work, Their work becomes their identity. So, Karmana is obsessed with the work. And then what happens by this? There is no real fulfillment. O Shamahas Pruha. The desire remains unsati insatiable desire. And that insatiable desire is basically the same as greed. So I want more and more and more. So there is no contentment over here. And even in the material world, many people are nowadays talking about say work life balance. Because at, even at a material level, Rajoguna is not very sustainable. There is there is a thrill that comes. Like, you know, when there is some exciting thing happening, there is a rush of adrenaline is there. And at a, bio, at a neurochemical level, that is exciting. But one cannot sustain that for a very long time. So Rajoguna is when the desires are very strong, when the urge to do new, new, more and more things is very strong. When the work that we are doing is disproportionate, it's excessive. Now you remember I said that this is both external and internal. So internally some people are driven towards being workaholics and externally some professions are such that you cannot succeed in those professions unless you become a workaholic. What to speak of succeed? You cannot even survive in those professions sometimes. So it's both external and internal. And uh, Many people, even materially minded people, they just, after some time they check out. 
this, this sojourn is too much. <clears throat> One of my friends in America is a is a trainer for attorneys, trainer for lawyers, and there are big, big university lawyers. And he says there is a, the feminism is there to some extent in India. In America, it is much, much more. So young women they want to rise to the top of their career. And when they rise, they want to be at the top, I'm as good as the man, or I'm better than the man. So then they also work very hard. in the law, especially if you want to be in top notch, you have to work 80 hours, 90 hours a week, sometimes more than that. And when they have to work like that, some of these young women, they work like that. But then, by the time they get 35, 40, see, what is the point of this? The most of them voluntarily start choosing, maybe working part time. Because they say, I want a family. I want, I want something more in my life. And they have no time for a relationship. Even if they have a relationship, they don't have time for this power. They don't have time for the children. So basically what happens, everyone, there is, there can be some satisfaction at the material level also. But for that, everyone needs Varana and everyone needs Ashram. So we could say Varana is broadly associated with our profession and Ashram is associated with our relation. So what is the kind of relationship we have with whom? So everybody for satisfaction needs Varana and Ashram. Now traditionally it was that males focus, okay let me put it here separately. The male focus was on Varana more than Asha, isn't it? That men used to go out and work and earn. Now, was the male focus not on Ashram? Of course it was there on Ashram. I'm working so that I can take care of my family. But in the case of men, the focus was more on Varana than Ashram. In the case of females, the focus was more on ashram than varana. That, okay, you know, take care of the home. Now, there are many reasons for this. The, for, before the industrial revolution and certainly before the information revolution, much of the work was physical. And the female body, no matter how much we claim equality, but the female body is physically frailer, weaker than the male body. So, when the work is more physical, males are more suited for that work. So, women would focus on home. And now if you look at even men, uh, why does a man work so hard? Varana without ashram doesn't satisfy anyone. Men work so hard that they can take care of the family. So, a person needs Varana and ashram together. But now what has happened is, women are taught you know, you should have only a career. In Indian society, for example, or any traditional society, if a woman is not able to have a child, it's considered a sad thing, an unfortunate thing. Mm -hmm. In America, not just America, I don't want to criticize America, in the Western world, they say that I'm not, I'm not a childless woman. I'm a child-free woman. So, it's such a distorted idea, isn't it? They say, you know, I'm a child-free woman. Mm -hmm. So, the women are taught that marriage and motherhood are traps. They will prevent you from growing in your career. And that is one of the main reasons in the western world, the population is decreasing. Because women don't want to sacrifice their career to have children. And then who is going to have children? Then? That's why they, although they don't want too many immigrants, they want immigrants, otherwise there's nobody to work over there. Nobody to carry on the generations. But the point is, this doesn't lead to any kind of fulfillment. Varna and Ashram both are there. And it is not that in traditional society, women always had to be only homemakers. Traditionally, women also had a Varna. We see that in Krishna Leela itself, there is a fruit vendor. And she's a woman. Selling fruits is her job. Even the gopis, it is said, they would go to Mathura or outside the city to sell butter and milk. But it is said, we kreetu kama kila gopa kanya. They would be so absorbed in Krishna, that normal in India, you want to sell, 
milk, milk, butter, butter, curd, curd, you sell, you promote your wares. But when the gopis would go, say Krishna, 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 Krishna. <laughs> and people would understand, <laughs> right, you know, okay, what, what have they got? <laughs> but the point is, they also had a job. It, but the key was, in the past, the varana did not interfere with the ashram. That they, people were able to manage their varana in such a way that they were able to take care of the ashram also. But especially after the industrial revolution, the jo job started going away from the homes. See, somebody has a farm next to their home. Then you can go and do a little work on the farm and come back home and take care of the child also. But when the job started going away from the homes, when the homes themselves had to be relocated because the jobs were in different cities, then what happened to the, ex, ex, the support system that was there for society? It, taking care of a child is not newborn baby. It's not just a one person's responsibility. It's very difficult if it's only one person. The extended family is required. Uh, I go to America regularly and what happened was, uh, the uh, Indians who settled in America, especially when they're going to have children, they, they don't want to come to India because the child is born in America, then naturally the child becomes an American citizen. And that's their dream. So they have to go for many years. So often the children become American citizens before their parents. The children are born. So they don't want to have the delivery happening in India. But they get their parents to America. So that they can, they can be there to take care. Now during the pandemic what happened is nobody could travel. And it was extremely difficult. So there's a whole genre of babies they call the pandemic babies so pandemic babies often they were you know, they are cognitively cognitively emotionally less developed because there was not much socialization and there's a whole issue but my point i'm making is that taking care of children ashram is very important but modern society makes it much much more difficult and so this fixation on varana at the expense of ashram for men it is bad, for women it is worse. See, the female psyche is made in such a way that women value relationships much more than men. Men value relationships, no doubt. Everybody needs relationships. But in prioritization, if you consider entertainment, men want more action movies. Hmm? Women, they want more relationships, romance, subtlety. Subtlety means more emotional exchanges. It's even if you read novels, there are novels which are meant for women and novels which are meant for men. There's a difference. But the point is, Varana and Ashram is required for everyone. And what Rajamuna does is, it creates an imbalance. Once, when one's identity becomes solely fixated on one's work alone, then it just doesn't work. So many women nowadays are told that, you know, you just pursue your career. You rise in your career and then when you're 50, 55, then you can comfortably have a child. But the problem is, the body cannot, the, the, there is a cycle for the female body and the body cannot bear eggs to have children. So they say, don't worry, you, give, you, you have your eggs now, we will extract them from your body and we will keep them in egg banks. And you can take them out of the egg banks when you have, want to have a baby afterwards. So all big companies, any of these big companies, Google or Amazon, each of the company is associated with a big egg bank. And many women, when they seek a job, it's a precondition is, do you have an egg bank or not? Otherwise, they won't take a job. And it's a huge thing. But the problem is, well, biologically, the eggs might be there, but for the female body to carry the baby at that age is very difficult. Now they say, okay, then, you know, you can just have a test tube baby or whatever. It's not that simple. That's why one of the things that is happening is uh, surrogate parenting or surrogate pregnancy. That you know that you take the egg from the man, you take the sorry the egg from the woman and the uh, semen from the, the sperm from the man, and then you hire a womb. You tell some woman that you know you beget this child and that child will be ours. So it's just a complete commercialization of everything. <laughs> so all this is Rajoguna. Rajoguna is associated with control. Control means you know, I don't want to submit to my body. Body has certain natural cycles. I don't want to submit to it. 
I don't want to cooperate with it. I want to control my body. So, um, there is a whole philosophy. It is called as transhumanism. This is especially popular in Silicon Valley, in the East Coast, in San Jose and that part of the world, California. They say that, you know, death, old age, disease, these are all problems. And the way we will transcend all these problems is by technological advancement. So, they are developing more and more technology to try to gain control. So, they say that old age, don't worry. One of my friends, he turned 50, he was in America and he said, from nowhere, I got so many uh, physical, email, physical mails and emails. So, you know, your digestion problem, no problem, you can take this medicine. You have backache, no problem, you have this therapy. Hmm? You have this, this. Ah, this is old age. Now, your real life begins after 50. Till now, you had to work. Now, you just enjoy life. And also, he was saying that you know uh, there is there is backache therapy, there is indigestion therapy, there is arthritis therapy. What you need is some illusion therapy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, I just try to take control of everything. Mm. There is huge propaganda that you you won't become old. But the International Gerontological Association it actually put up gerontology is a study of old age and care for old age, they put out an announcement in public interest that currently there is no technology, no medication, no mechanism available that can either reverse, stop or slow the aging process. Then what can we do? We can only hide the aging. That is all that we can do. If your face is getting wrinkled, you know, we can do something by the wrinkles don't seem to be there. I said things like Botox, people consume them so much. In fact, there is a whole debate that men should also be taking Botox. You know what is Botox? Okay, Botox is what women use to try to look young. Hmm? So now there is a whole debate that why is there discrimination against men? Men should also use Botox. <laughs> and they should also look young. So this Rajoguna is crazy. And then from Rajoguna, things go down to Tamoguna. So let's look at Tamoguna. Hmm? <laughs> so a prakasho. A prakasho is there is no illumination, there is no clarity. So in fact, Krishna is talking about the opposite. Prakasha was the defining characteristic of Sattva. Huh? And pravritti was the characteristic of Rajas. So a prakasho, a pravritti. Neither prakash nor pravritti is there. So then what is there? Pramada. Pramada is madness. Moha. Moha is illusion. Eva, certainly. Tamasya etani jayante. Arjuna. And these are the, these are what arise because of Tamoguna. Vivruddhe. When it is become prominent. Kurunandana. Aprakasho apravrittisya. Aprakasho apravrittisya. Pramado moha eva cha. Pramado moha eva cha. Tamasye tani jayante. Tamasye tani jayante. Vivruddhe kurunandana. Vivruddhe kurunandana. So, in Tamo, in Sattva Guna, one wants clarity. Hmm? One wants understanding. Prakash. In Rajoguna, one wants power, control. But one just doesn't care for any of these things. Hmm? That is basically, one just wants to escape from the world. So, Pramada and Moha, it is like madness and illusion. So, both are similar, but his madness is more on the mind. Illusion can be more external. Like watching movies. Just getting into a, getting lost in a fictional world. That is moha. But madness is where our own mind becomes disconnected from reality. So both ways, essentially the characters of tama, tamas, is what? Escape from reality. can be through madness 
Oh, that is, it's more internal. And illusion, it's more external. Once I was, when I was in America, I had many college programs. So when I was going for a college program, I asked them, which college is this? They said, this is the American Institute of Illusion. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, it is the it is the where people, it is the college where people get training to make movies. So it's like illusion, illusion basically. <laughs> now, how do you make illusion? Now, what happens is hundreds of movies, thousands of movies are made. Now, some of the movies do well. Some do few do very well. They become blockbusters. That what is the opposite of that? Flop. Flop. So now, there's a new word that has come: flop buster. <laughs> <laughs> that is not just a flop. You spend five hundred million dollars, and 0.5 million dollars also did not make. It's like a total devastating loss. It's like sometimes, you know, a ship drowns, but some people escape, or majority of the people escape. But sometimes the ship drowns so thoroughly that no one comes to know also it is drowned. <laughs> like, because anybody who could tell also is gone completely. <laughs> so sometimes this movies happen. Now, why does that happen? Why do movies flop? Because the illusion is not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> People want to escape. And you know, the characters are not relatable, the hero or heroine is not good looking, or the action is not whatever realistic or unrealistic, whatever it is. Then, what they say is, this is, this is just so boring. Till a few years ago, Hollywood used to make fun of Bollywood movies. They say that the Bollywood movies, or Indian movies in general, even South Indian also, whatever it is, they say, you know, that everything is so unrealistic in it. Like the fight scenes. <laughs> Uh, they have no respect for logic or laws of gravity or anything else. <laughs> and you know, they just can't figure out, you want to have a movie, you are trying to replicate real life in a more entertaining way, but suddenly in the middle of real life, who starts dancing? <laughs> so, they used to make fun of this. But now, there is the influence of Bollywood is also increasing. And the West also people, some uh, some Bollywood movies have won some big awards and stuff like that. But the point is that there may be different ways people may try to escape. So to the Western mind, what happens is you know, this is too unrealistic. You can't believe it. Everybody has to suspend disbelief to some extent. When you watch a movie, Superman suddenly starts flying through the sky. So what happens is, is you have to suspend disbelief to some extent. But the way the Western mind suspends disbelief. Now... The Indian mind suspends this belief that's slightly different. So there might be different kinds of moha for different minds. But the point is everybody wants escapism. Mm -hmm. And people seek escapism in different ways. So Tabas is this reality is so boring. And rather than do the work to make the reality better, at least in Rajoguna, we try to control so that we make reality better. But Tamoguna just escape from reality. So, traditionally, India had, so in one sense, you know, escapism, it's basically like a painkiller. Life is boring, life is frustrating. Generally, when we say distress, distress can range over a wide spectrum. Distress can, means life can just be dissatisfying. Life can also be devastating. So dissatisfying is often associated with boring, but devastating is associated with something which is unbearable. So distress can be over a wide range and people want to escape from the distress. So when we say this world is a place of Dukkhalayam, that doesn't mean everybody is in a state of misery where they are crying tears. No, of course not. But who can say that I am satisfied with my life? Everybody has some or the other dissatisfaction which for them is tormenting. For somebody else, what is the big deal? 
but for them it's a big deal. So the world is a place of distress and when people want to escape. So escaping is like a painkiller. Painkiller means that one has a disease but rather than trying to cure the disease, one just takes a pay, uh, some pill which, make, which covers the pain. So India traditionally had two painkillers. One was Bollywood and the other is cricket. Now about 15 years both of them got married. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a child, IPM. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a double dose pain killer. <laughs> so uh, the enter see, entertainment has always been a part of human society. And yes, people want to break from life. That's fine. Krishna says Yukta Ahara Viharasya. So recreation entertainment is a part of life. But now people are so caught in entertainment that entertainment is not a break from life. Life is a break from entertainment. <laughs> Like the entertainment world is the real world. You know, okay, what is my score in the video game? I want to move forward. I want to, I want to win more. I want to get to a higher level. Yeah, I just have to go and eat some food. I just have to go and do a job or this or that. I'll come back and play the video game. <laughs> AFK. So, I'll just come back soon. So, basically it's like that. So, I saw one cartoon where a man is telling his friend, you know, yesterday my broadband Wi-Fi went down. So, I spent some time with my family. <laughs> They seem to be like nice people. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the moment. People just escape from the real world. And this is very toxic. And this, this also is associated with mental health problems like depression. Where you know, one just finds reality unlivable. So, we can see that these three modes and the characteristics of these three modes are very much evident especially Rajoguna and Tamaguna in our society. And then Krishna says that if we live in Sattvaguna, we will get elevated. Urdhvam Gacchim Sattvastha. If we are Rajoguna, we will stagnate. This is where we will stay. If we are Tamaguna, we will get degraded. And after hearing this, Arjuna asks a question. He says, he basically asks three questions. What are the characteristics of a person in, how do I know what are the characteristics of, a, of the three modes, of a person in the three modes? Kindlingais, let's go to this verse, I'll explain the verse and then we'll look at the answer and that's how we'll conclude this class. So, Kairlingais three gunanetan. Now, Linga generally means gender, but Linga basically also means symptom or characteristic. So, what are the symptoms? Kairlingais three gunanetan. Atito Bhavati Prabhu. So he is primarily asking not the characteristics of three modes, he is asking about the characteristics of the person who has transcended the three modes. Krishna concludes by saying that one who has transcended these modes, that person is as good as liberated. That person is situated with me and will ultimately attain me. So, what are the characteristics? And then he says, Kim Achar, her. what is the behavior? So, what is the difference between the two? The first is more internal. Now, how can I know that I have transcended the modes? I can look at my own consciousness. I can't look at other people's consciousness. So then I can look at their behavior. Kim Achar. What is the behavior by which I can know they are transcended? And then finally, Katham Chaitams. How can one transcend the modes? It's basically like if we consider the modes to be like a disease, then how can know I know that I am healthy? How can I know that others are healthy? And how can we all become healthy? That's essentially the question. Hmm? And Arjuna's question is then answered by Krishna. So, if you consider the modes, now we'll see why is it considered disease? Because disease, disease is that which keeps us away from ease, away from comfort. So, the comfort of a natural condition, realizing as less souls, the modes are a disease. So Ajana's question is, how can I know, what are three things? I am healthy, second is, others are healthy and third is, yes, 
हाउ टू बिकम हेल्दी सो वी विल लुक एट द आंसर टू दिस थ्री क्वेश्चन नाउ कृष्णा बिगिन फर्स्ट बाई टॉकिंग अबाउट द इंटरनल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स एंड लेट्स लुक एट दैट वर्स Okay, it's a long verse. We'll recite this. I'll explain the first part, and we'll recite the second part. Prakasham cha pravrtim cha moha meva cha pandava. If you see these three words, Krishna is talking about. They are the characteristics of three modes: prakash is sattva, pravrti is rajas, and moha is tamas. So Krishna says, he does that na dveshti sam pravrtani. That when they come, one doesn't resent them. Oh, why am I feeling like this? They come. न निवृत्ता कांक्षति वेन दे गो अवे ओ वाई एम ए नो लॉन्गर फीलिंग लाइक दिस इट कैन वर्क बोथ वेज समटाइम्स एन सत्व गुणा वी मे इफ सम एम्बिशन सम क्रेविंग दैट कम्स अप आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू वर्क वाई एम आई फीलिंग लाइक दिस बट समटाइम्स ऑफ पीपल डिस्कवर द पैशन दे वॉन्ट सम एक्साइटमेंट एंड दिंग सेंशुअल एक्साइटमेंट इज देर समटाइम्स आफ्टर दैट फीलिंग गोज अवे दे वेन इन दिस फीलिंग कम बैक now that can apply to sattva also krishna said these are just like uh, these are just like events that happen in our psychological world remember the metaphor of the city thing people will come in people will go out don't be too attached to them so he says not dwesh one doesn't resent when some one of these arrives one doesn't crave when one of them goes what does one do udasin vad asino udasin means detach but vad means as if as if detached asino One stays. So udasi na vadasi no. Udasi na vadasi no. Then gunairyo na vichalyate. Vichalyate means is shaken. One understands that this is happening because of the modes. One doesn't become shaken by them. Gunairyo na vichalyate. Gunairyo na vichalyate. And guna vartanti tiyeva. That one understands that all this is happening because of the modes. Because of the modes, sometimes I'll feel hey, I have to do so many things. Sometimes I feel I don't want to do anything at all. Sometimes I may want to think, oh, what am I really doing in my life? But these are the modes. Guna vartan tithye. Because of the guna, movement of the guna, this is happening. Yo avatishti. One who sees like this, they, that person stays steady. No avatishti means to be steady. Tishti is to be situated. Avatishti means to be. Firmly situated, neingate. Again, Krishna says, one is not swayed, one is not shaken. Yo, but this that is neingate. Yo, but this that is neingate. So let us recite it together. Udasi na vadasi no gunai yo na vichal jate guna vartan ke devam yo but this that is neingate. So let's see what Krishna is trying to say over here. Udasina vadasina. So as if detached. So now there are two words in English. I'll write the words and you can tell me if there is any difference between them. There is disinterested and there is uninterested. Is there a difference between these two words? Or you are not interested. Disinterest, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hate. Disinterest is hating. Uninterested, not liking. Oh. <laughs> I am both not liking and hating these explanations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it's a fair guess, but it is not a accurate guess. Disinterested, from starting, I am not interested because uninterested, maybe this time I am. Interesting explanation. <laughs> okay, it's a reasonable explanation. But okay, I'll give you an idea. Uh, uninterested is associated with interest and interesting. Disinterested is associated with vested interests. You know the word vested interests? You heard this? Yeah, selfish. So, okay, uninterested basically means just I don't care. i don't care i am uninterested in this but disinterested means i am not partial 
neutral. So, in one sense that disinterested means I don't care. No, uninterested means I don't care. Disinterested means I am impartial. Now, to understand the difference, let's consider the example of an umpire in a cricket match. Say the baller bowls the ball and the ball goes and hits the legs of the batsman and all the fielders appeal. How's that? And the umpire says, I was not watching the ball. <laughs> what are you doing? That's your job, isn't it? So in a cricket match, should an umpire be uninterested or disinterested? Disinterested. disinterested. If the umpire is uninterested, that won't work, isn't it? <laughs> so that's their work. But disinterested means the umpire should not be favoring one side. No, just because one side appeals, oh, it's out. The umpire should not be deciding the appeal based on the volume of the appeal. The umpire should be deciding the appeal based on the value or virtue of the appeal. Is it right? So, similarly, umpire is basically, that decides what? Based on volume. How loud it is. That would be bad. Decides on the value or virtue of the appeal. Means, is it true? Is it actually the merit of the appeal? So, like that, Krishna is saying, we become an umpire inside our own consciousness. And there are many desires and emotions that will pop up. Hey, Come on, eat this, read this, watch this, touch this. So, we cannot be uninterested because it's happening inside our own world. But we are disinterested. That means just because this desire has come, oh, I won't say yes to it. No. Is it of value? Is it not of value? So, that's why it's not udasin, it is udasin, the work, as if detached. So, often it is said, become an observer of your own mind. That means, observe what kind of thoughts are coming. But what happens is, we are not an obser observer of our thoughts or desires or emotions. We become a uh, actor based on our thoughts, emotions and desires. We adopt them and start acting them. But we don't have to adopt or act them. We have to observe them. So when we are disinterested, then what happens is, we are able to Observe. Now, after observing, we analyze. And after analyze, we regulate. So, this is a oar. When we are in ocean, if we are in a boat in an ocean, then what we need? We need an oar to navigate the ocean. So, observe, evaluate, regulate. So observe, say umpire observes, say what happened over here? And after observing, evaluate. And then the player says, ah, that's out. No, it's not out. And they keep appealing, out, out. No, not out. Just become silent. Let's play. So like that, many things will come up inside us. But we, we don't succumb to them. And the external symptom that Krishna will talk about after this is, that if we are not succumbing to this, then we will not be affected by the dualities. This is man, apman, sukha, dukha. In all of these, we will stay equal. So, this is the characteristic of someone who has transcended the modes. That's it. In life, there will always be dualities. Kabi kushi, kabi gam. That's natural. Now, what happens? For most people, when there are dualities, so th these are the world's dualities. But then, in response to them, we have our mind's dualities. They are much, much more. It's like, say, if somebody goes to a job and their boss gives them some, appreciates them. Oh, this is the best job in the world. I love this job. And next day, the boys, the boss gives them some feedback. I hate this job. Why did I even take this job? Or somebody in a relationship one day. I love you. I can't live without you. And next day, 
I hate you. I can't live with you. So just a person is tossed up and down. So life has its ups and downs, but the mind's ups go way up and the mind's downs go way down. So this happens when a person is tossed around by the moods. But so mind's realities is basically tossed by moods. But when a person is regulated, then what will happen is they might be okay. This color visible. So they might be slightly affected, but overall, it, the person who is beyond the moods. This is yeah, life happiness will come, distress will come. Let's stay steady and move on. Now, even in the modern society. Uh, this is appreciated. Say so if somebody can stay cool under pressure, then that's appreciated. But what happens is people want to celebrate like mad when they win and they expect, you know, I'll stay unaffected when I lose. It doesn't work like that. No, <laughs> happiness and distress are two sides of the same coin. The more we celebrate when we are happy, the more we'll be devastated when we suffer, so when we fail. So this is a duality. So we said go beyond the duality. So by becoming an inner observer and understanding that these are just coming and going and none of them are going to stay. Now the last question Arjuna has asked is how do we go beyond this? So there the answer is at one's lens it's a, it's a paradoxical answer. That means it doesn't make sense. It seems to be self-contradictory. But it is not self contrary Please look at the answer. Now Krishna says, Maam chayo unto me avyabhicharena, without any deviation. Bhakti yogena sevati, one who serves me through bhakti yoga. Maam chayo avyabhicharena, Maam chayo avyabhicharena, Bhakti yogena sevate, Bhakti yogena sevate, that person, Sir Gunan, these boards, samatit yaitan. That person will, atit means to go beyond. Samatit yaitan. That person will go beyond that and Brahma bhuya yakalpate. So Brahma refers to the spiritual platform. That person will attain to the kalpate, will attain the spiritual platform. Sagunan samatit yaitan. Sagunan samatit yaitan. Brahma bhuya yakalpate. Brahma bhuya yakalpate. So together, Maam Chayo Vyabhicharena Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunan Samati Yaitan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. So, what now the problem or the paradox? See, paradox means it's an apparent contradiction. It seems contradictory, but it's not contradictory. So, what is the paradox over here? Krishna is saying that by unbreakable, unbreaking bhakti, you can go beyond moves. That's the solution Krishna is saying. But then, we may say the problem is that it is the modes that cause breaks in our bhakti. Isn't it? See, I want to practice bhakti, but when Rajoguna and Tamoguna become very strong, that's when Sarva Dharma and Parityaja Maya Mekam Sharanam <laughs> We just succumb to Maya. So, what is the solution then? So the point is, here it's important to understand that when Krishna is saying unbreakable devotion, devotion can be at many different levels. It can be in terms of intention, it can be in terms of emotion, it can be in terms of action. So for example, when you want to chant, 
Now, we may have the intention to chant attentively, but sometimes we may not be able to chant. So, Krishna see, so we might just feel so bored, we might feel so tired. What do we do? So, you know what, what Krishna sees at one level is our feelings. But Krishna also sees our feelings about our feelings. <coughs> what do I mean by that? Let's say when I'm trying to chant and I'm feeling bored, then what do I do about it? Do I pray Krishna? Krishna, your holy name is so merciful. I don't want to feel bored. I, I want to connect with you. I want to serve you. I want to be attentive. Please help me. So do we just welcome that feeling of boring and think, forget it, I won't chant it. This is a waste of time. Or we just look for an excuse to distract ourselves. So, in some ways, we discussed earlier today morning about how there is, when we experience certain desire, that the biological, psychological and just intentional aspect of it. So, unbreakable bhakti, at the highest level, then the intention, emotion and action, all of it is there. That, but, even if it is if at the level of intention, that is good. If it is if at the level of action, that is good. If it is a level of all three, it is the best. If it is even at the level of the emotion, that is good. Sometimes we just that emotion comes, sometimes we, we like bhakti, sometimes we don't. But one of these we can at least maintain. So unbreakable does not mean that it has to be completely unbreakable at all levels. Sometimes we may not feel like practicing bhakti. Sometimes our conditioning may be so strong that we might fall. But after we fall, what do we do? Krishna, this doesn't work for me. Just, why am I wasting my time? I'll just give it up. No. We think that. So let me let me work on this. Let me try to improve this. Then that is wonderful. So basically, going back to this diagram, if we are here among the waves then what we can do is our relationship with Krishna Krishna is like the anchor and Bhakti is the process by which we catch hold of that anchor so Bhakti can be in terms of intention, in terms of emotion, in terms of action, whatever if we just hold on to Krishna then gradually we will go beyond the modes. It will take time. But the, and even if there are breaks, and, yeah, sometimes there will be big breaks, sometimes there will be small breaks. And gradually the big breaks will become lesser and lesser and lesser. But the idea here is if you consider the anchor. Now, if there's an anchor and I hold on to the anchor, then even if a strong wave comes, the wave will hit me. But the way will it throw me away? Yeah, it will hit me and it will seem to throw me away. But if I can just hold on to that anchor, then what will happen? Then we will not be thrown away. But sometimes the wave will be so strong that and maybe the strong wave hits at the time when we are let go on the anchor or we are holding on to the anchor very loosely. We just get thrown. So then what will happen? Then the anchor has gone away. No. The wonderful thing is, Krishna is actually like the anchor that extends throughout the ocean. No matter how far we have gone, wherever we go, Krishna is there. We may be in Sattva Guna, Krishna is there. We may be in Rajoguna, Krishna is there. We may be in Tamoguna, Krishna is there. Whichever mode we are in there, no matter how far we are thrown away by the modes, we are never far away from Krishna. So, of course, it's, it's put in another way, I'll conclude this point, that we may be far away from Krishna in the sense that, yes, our consciousness may not at all be anywhere near the ocean, but Krishna is never far away from us. Sarvasya chaham rudhi sannivishtu. Rudhi is not in the heart, sannivishtu, closely situated. He is always close to us. 
and this is the anchor which you can always hold on to. So, yes, in Tamaguna it may be a little more difficult. In Tamaguna, we may not be able to hold on to the anchor in the same way that we can do in Sattvaguna. And say, when we are agitated in Sattvaguna, we can read some philosophy. I mean, that's the way we connect with Krishna. Maybe in Rajaguna, that's not possible for him. In Tamaguna, that's not possible. But there is some way or the other we can connect with Krishna. Prabhupada would say that somebody may be drunk, but they can come and chant Hare Krishna. They can dance in Kirtans. And that will connect them with Krishna. Prabhupada went so far even to say that that if an alcoholic cannot give up alcohol, if they think that the taste of alcohol is Krishna, then that remembrance of Krishna will help them to become a devotee one day. Now he's not saying that drinking alcohol will make them a devotee. <laughs> they cannot give up alcohol. So an alcoholic, somebody is there. Then, drinking itself will take them away from Krishna. That is natural. But, remembering, remembering what? Krishna, what is, this, what is this taste of this alcohol? It is just some liquid. Actually, everything attractive comes from you. So, even the taste of this alcohol comes from you. That taste of alcohol now we say, is the taste of alcohol Krishna? Well, everything attractive is Krishna. This is, this will be talking in the 10th chapter when we talk about Vibhuti. That in the last session we'll be discussing. So that can take us toward Krishna. In fact, there is a Western author. He wrote, the taste of wine is the proof that God loves us. <laughs> if God did not exist, how could something as tasty as wine exist? How oh, we say, you know, there are so many tasty things in life. Uh, why are you thinking about wine? Well, because that is that person's conception of pleasure. Oh, and God has arranged such enjoyment. God is so kind. So, that is that in some way or the other, even when a person is enjoying or a person is enjoying alcohol, they cannot give up alcohol. Is that going to cause a break in their Krishna consciousness? Yes, at one level. But at another level, if even the thing that they are enjoying, if they can see the Krishna connection over there, somebody like a mad addicted to cricket, say. Uh, addiction to cricket is a strong word, we are attached to cricket. So, I just can't give up. Okay, then some talented players are there. But their ability to bat, their ability to bowl, all abilities come from Krishna. Now, of course, all abilities may not take us toward Krishna. So, that is a subject we will discuss when we talk about Vibhutis. Like, an attractive woman's beauty also comes from Krishna. Mm -hmm. But, uh, dwelling on that beauty is not likely to take us towards Krishna. Isn't it? <laughs> so, oh, when I was a child, there was some song in a movie. When I read the Ra Ramayana, Hmm. And there's a statement of Brahman, eh? which I have read this somewhere, I remember this somewhere. So basically, then I, I thought, where did I remember? And then I remembered that song. So basically, what Ravan says is, when he says Sita, he says, You are so beautiful that after fashioning your beauty, the creator must have retired. Because the creator cannot make anything more beautiful than you. So, there was this Bollywood song, Tarif karu kya uski jisne tumhe banaya. So, now the thing is, Rahul is acknowledging as a creator who has made you, but he is not interested in the creator, he is interested in, and she and she's made for me. And I can take her against her force, against her will also. So, but the point is that there is somebody attracted to beauty. That generally, that attraction to beauty is not going to take us towards Krishna. But if if we acknowledge that even this beauty is coming from Krishna, then there is some level of Krishna consciousness over there. Now, of course, the attraction to beauty is very strong. From the attraction to beauty to Krishna consciousness may take a long time. 
बहुनाम जन्मना मनते ऑल्सो इट मे टेक मेनी लाइफ टाइम्स बट थिंग इज दैट कृष्णा कॉन्शियसनेस डज नॉट हैव टू बी वन और जीरो Sometimes there may be situations where a person may seem to be very far away from Krishna consciousness, but no matter how far away we are, some level of Krishna consciousness is always possible. So that that's what that's the meaning of I'm saying. No matter where a person is in the ocean, the anchor extends throughout the ocean. Now that of course does not mean that the land is equally close from everywhere in the ocean. Ultimately, you don't don't want to stay in the anchor, stay holding on to the anchor in the ocean forever. We want to get to the land. So, what this means is, when we are talking about Krishna consciousness, it is it is both accommodating and demanding. Accommodating means no matter how much conditionings we have. there is always some way in which you can connect with krishna in that sense it's accommodating but in another sense it is demanding we want to connect with krishna some connection with krishna is always possible no matter how terrible a situation we are in no matter how terrible a thing we have done no matter how terrible things have happened to us in our life some connection with krishna is always possible but krishna consciousness is demanding means we want ultimately a whole hearted connection with krishna we want to offer our entire heart to krishna so that's what ultimately will oxygen sorry that that's what is ultimately fulfill our heart also when our heart is completely absorbed in krishna so i'll conclude this with one metaphor what this means it's accommodating and demanding as a consider relationship say boy proposes to girl is please marry me and the girl says why is yes, because no other girl in town is ready to marry me <laughs> now that is not the most flattering of proposals <laughs> that is not the most romantic proposal but now if the girl says yes that shows the girl's love for the boy not the boy's love for the girl isn't it that the boy's love for the girl will be shown and even when he has options even when there is some temptation he stays with her. so like that same dynamic if we apply to our relationship with krishna for most people we pray to god when nothing else is working oh god i have tried everything nothing else works please help me basically what is saying god you are my last alternative now so now it is krishna's kindness that even when he is our last alternative he accepts us but that shows krishna's love for us not our love for krishna isn't it our love for krishna will be when he becomes our first alternative this is what we'll be discussing in the seventh chapter when we come to it that you know there is anyone for any reason somebody can be seeking wealth somebody can be in distress and they go to god that's fine krishna says good that you come to me but then krishna says who are the mahatmas they choose krishna alone vasudev sarvamiti krishna is the best so krishna consciousness is demanding in the it's accommodating in the sense that that krishna can be our last choice and still krishna accepts us but is demanding in the sense that krishna needs to become our first choice so that unbreakable connection with krishna that unbreakable bhakti what it means is at one level even if krishna is a last choice that's fine sometimes we just fall for sense gratification sometimes what happens is we do a little sense gratification and our mind says now we have fallen just fall down completely so do more and more and more and then we get so frustrated that 
okay, I'm, I'm so fed up now. I, I'm disgusted. Then because we we just can't enjoy anymore. Then we just turn toward Krishna and we pray to Krishna, Krishna, I'm sorry. Okay, Krishna accepts that also. But over a period of time, Krishna needs to become our first choice. So, because of the modes, sometimes the influence might be such that there might be a break in the sense that in Rajoguna, Tamaguna, we might go elsewhere. But if as soon as possible we come back to Krishna, if our intention to connect with Krishna is not weakened, then gradually we will rise upwards. And as Krishna becomes our first choice, that means not only does our grip become strong on the anchor, but also we become trained to know how to hold strongly to the anchor. Then what will happen is, even when a wave hits us, we will be able to hold on to the anchor. And that's when we will go beyond the modes. So I'll summarize what we discussed today. We discussed today based on the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And the first point we discussed was the modes itself. So Krishna is addressing Arjuna's unspoken question about Sankhya worldview by talking about the modes. And modes we discussed many metaphors. First was ropes. Ropes, they are basically ropes that link consciousness and matter. Not so much link as bind. Then they are also like colors or pixels. Hmm? They are like the building blocks of nature. And they are also Gear. gears. So once we get into a particular mode, we start functioning in a particular way. So then we discussed about the characteristics of each of the modes. Sattva is associated with clarity. Rajas is associated with activity, which can very easily become hyperactivity. And Tamas is associated with lethargy. These are the defining characteristics that Krishna talks about in 6 to 8 in this chapter. Then we discussed about the prominence of the mode. This was the place where we said we spent most of our time. Isn't it? So we discussed how in Sattva there is illumination. The door of the senses there is illumination by which we can understand what to take in, what not to take in. Then Rajas, it is basically, we discussed there is craving and then there is workaholism. So in workaholism, we discussed how that Varana becomes much, much more important than Ashram. And this can happen for men and this can happen even for women. And it becomes toxic for society when this starts happening. Uh, and then Tamas, we discussed that. Tamas is associated with escapism. So escapism can be just by madness and more and more people have become mentally disturbed and then it is by illusion. So we discussed how the entertainment has become maniac now. People, entertainment has always been a part of people's lives but now there is a mania associated with it. It has become crazy about entertainment. They see life as a break from entertainment. And then lastly, we discussed about that the characteristic for transcending or transcended, the characteristic of the trans, those who are transcended is that they are udasin. You become an observer. So observer, here we discuss elaborately the concept of being disinterested versus uninterested. So uninterested means, this is an example of a cricket umpire who judges appeals based not on their volume but on their value. What is the merit of the appeal? So like that, desires will keep coming, desires, emotions will keep coming within us. Mm. We discussed that emotions, they are based on what we perceive. And desires are associated with what we pursue. What are we chasing? So, once we are observers, then after that, the second is, we can be evaluators. That's the idea of being an umpire. And third is, we can be regulators. So, we discussed the OAR, the OR acronym. And the last part is, how to transcend. So, at one level, 
you could say an analytical way of dealing with the modes is to observe, evaluate, regulate. But the devotional way, mm, sorry, OAR, it's not evaluator, it is analyzer. So the, this is the more of the analytical way. The devotional ways we transcend by bhakti which is unbreakable. And then the idea of unbreakable bhakti we talked about at three levels. It can be at intention, emotion or action. And the idea of staying connected with Krishna means that amid the dualities of the world, Krishna is like the anchor that extends throughout the ocean and Krishna consciousness is both accommodating and demanding. Accommodating means that Krishna loves us so much that even if it is the last choice, Krishna will accept it. But demanding means ultimately Krishna wants us to become his, Krishna wants that he be our first choice. So by such unbreakable bhakti, we all can transcend the moves. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Prabhupada, I have two questions. One regarding specific chapter and one regarding Gita in general. Hmm. Uh, first is, we... Learned about consciousness, we often uh, hear the word, but what is the like, exact meaning and uh, like relatable, like a little vague to understand consciousness. And second is like in Gita itself, like why is it poetic? Is Sanskrit itself poetic, or why did Krishna and Arjuna speak in poetic language on a battlefield? Okay, both of these questions will take some time. Alright, uh, are there any other questions directly related to the topic? Okay, I'll answer the first question right now, consciousness briefly, because consciousness is related. So, consciousness is basically, it can be known in two ways, there's internal and external. So, internally, consciousness is the capacity for awareness. So, capacity for awareness means that each one of us have a capacity. So, you are looking at me, you are thinking. And when something is becoming clear, you may feel excited, eh? you are feeling something. Or it's becoming exhausting, you might feel bored, whatever, different feelings are there. So, when there is awareness, awareness as thinking, feeling and willing. So, this capacity itself is called consciousness. Now, the word consciousness has multivalent things. Consciousness can refer sometimes to the uh, the observer and also the territory being observed. What it means is, like, let me say, where is my consciousness? So, oh, my consciousness is caught over there. That means what? I am observing where is my consciousness. So it's a little subtle but the whole idea is that there is uh, consciousness is the capacity for awareness and that capacity can be directed in various ways. So if I consider my phone, now this is the battery and when the battery light is coming out. So the battery is like the soul and the, the beam of light coming out is consciousness. However, why it is that simple? But what happens is when we talk about consciousness, sometimes we refer to it as the beam of light, but sometimes we also refer to it as the not just the capacity to be aware, but we also refer to it as the content of awareness. My consciousness has gone down. That means what? Within my consciousness, there are things which are not very uplifting, that are degrading. So consciousness in that sense refers both to the capacity and the content. The capacity for being aware and the content of awareness. But broadly speaking, consciousness is the 
capacity for awareness, which is an intrinsic characteristic of the soul. Now, why did Krishna and Arjuna speak on the battlefield in a poetic way? Well, it's not just Krishna and Arjuna, the whole Mahabharata is in a poetic way. So, the Bhagavad Gita is simply a part of the Mahabharata. Yes, please. Uh, Prabhu, like yesterday you told how like soul, the connection between soul, mind, and body. Hmm. So, can you, like, I am not able to, uh, can you please help me in fitting in these, like, three modes of uh, nature in that picture? Uh, and are these uh, modes, like, yesterday you told there is a link between uh, us and the mind by which we interact? Are these those links or something? Mm. Well, not exactly. The soul is here, the mind is here. Now from the soul, you could say, consciousness flows to, through the mind to the outer world. Okay? Just to continue this metaphor, what I mentioned, the soul The soul is generally the root of consciousness, in the sense that from the soul consciousness originates. Now the mind is the root of consciousness, the pathway through which consciousness comes out and goes to the outside world. So now we could say, to take this metaphor further, this root has multiple lanes within it. So, it's like, in one sense, the consciousness can go anywhere. You can go cross country also. But generally, if you are driving, you will go on the road, you will go on the lanes. So, these lanes are like the modes. So, consciousness tends to go along certain tracks. Now, of course, we say the modes can also mix. So, there are subtleties over here. But the, the link, now generally when we say link between two, cities. You can have a, like a physical road that links the two and then you can have people or vehicles or messages going along the road that link the two. So the pathway through which the link happens, that pathway is the modes. But then the consciousness flowing in the form of desires, in the form of emotions, that is the actual link that is happening. So the actual communication, when you talk about link, it is, it is the infrastructure for the link and there is the information that goes around when there is a link. Information or transportation or relation, whatever, people going along it. Transportation, transportation of information or people. So, a transportation of information or of people. So, that infrastructure is like the modes. Hmm? And the actual information, that is the desires and emotions that are going along. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, like, uh, do these uh, gunas change like these ropes now that you initially used? So, like, uh, is there any certain proportion in which they remain in every person or do they change their identity? Well, the controlling mode can change. Say, for example, with respect to sleeping, everybody will need to sleep. But a person, Sattvaguna, will know when to sleep and to wake up. So, Tamaguna doesn't take control of them and control of their life. Like a person in Tamaguna, they'll sleep even when they don't want to. And they will not be able to sleep when they want to. Now that could be a disease insomnia, but it could also be an influence of Tamagona. So the controlling mode changes as we evolve. To some extent the modes will be there always. Can a person change them? Like, is it the static, the connection, like this infrastructure that you told now? Is it yeah. static? Well, the, well, do the modes change? Well, the pathways are always there, but we may choose not to travel by a particular pathway. So in that, the, is, the, is the infrastructure going to change? Well, you can say that if a road is not used, it will just become disused, it will become broken. 
it will disintegrate. That's also a possibility. Yes, bro. Two, three questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, technology and the discussed that greed is the like, root cause of being in a mode of passion that emerges. So, how can we like uh, address this issue? Like, how can we voluntarily restrain ourselves from getting, like, for example, uh, I'm doing some studies in a in night and suppose some I like I get like uh, I'm like this flow uh, into the flow completely. I just forget I have to sleep. I have to wake up early. So like, how can I voluntarily restrain myself in those situations when my our intelligence and mind are completely into the action? Yeah, it's tough, and we have to do it gradually. So generally speaking, our mores shape what we desire, what we feel. In general, you can say what we value. And we can't change what we value immediately. But even within our framework, we can see what is of higher value. So for example, I may say that studies is very important for my career is very important for me. But then you may say that, okay, for my career, my health is also important. If I spoil my health, it won't work. For my career, my mind is also very important. If my mind is disturbed, if my mind is restless, then I won't be able to focus, I won't be able to work. So I need to take care of my body, I need to take care of uh, my, mm, my mind. And then gradually we can start valuing other things also. So in one sense, I was going to talk about this later, but let's quickly mention this. Prabhupada defines realization. And we could apply that in a broader sense. In the first kind of Prabhupada says, realization means, say if this is the message of scripture and these are the interests of the audience interests of people so what we need to do is a realized preacher is one who is able to take the message of scripture and present it in a way that is interesting to the audience that means they are able to find the area of intersection between the two so that is realization. Otherwise, somebody can just speak a formulaic way and that may not connect with the audience at all. Okay, what is the interest of this audience? And which part of scripture can I connect? That's realization. Now, having said this, we could apply that to say, I have my say I have my present interests. Okay, no more. I have my present interests, and then there are spiritual interests or higher interests in life. So I need to find out where my present interests intersect with spiritual interests. So just like say when we are doing outreach to students, you know, you may say if you want to study better, if you chant, if you practice bhakti, if you discipline your life, you will be able to study better. So what we are doing is we are linking the spiritual interest with people present interests and that's how it works in the west for example christianity had the prominent idea that god is like the cosmic supplier oh father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread but now in the west most people don't have to worry much about bread they may have to worry about jam but not bread <laughs> So, the idea of God as a cosmic supplier is not very relevant. So then what has happened is many churches, they have rebranded God. Not so much as a cosmic, cosmic uh, supplier as a cosmic therapist. It's like, you know, you come to God, you feel good, you feel happy. Will, oh, give God all your troubles and you'll feel sheltered and you'll feel unburdened. So, the idea is that you don't need physical goods. Okay, you need mental good. And that's what God will provide. So, that's, that's in one sense, uh, it, is, it, it is not wrong to do that. Although sometimes it can just become therapeutic completely and there's nothing transcendental left then. That should not happen. But that is we should be able to connect our interests with spiritual interests. 
and then gradually spiritual interests will become priority for us. So in the specific case, say if we have ambition for our studies and we are focused on the work, then we can connect that, okay, this, this ability Krishna has given me, even this interest Krishna has given me, this is a gift from Krishna. So thank Krishna for the ability. Thank Krishna for the interest. And say that if Krishna has given this much to me, you know, Krishna has not given it to me so that I don't use it, I neglect it, reject it. But Krishna wants me to use it. And if I am to use it well, it's just like parents give pocket money to children. When children use the pocket money well, they can give more also. Isn't it? So ultimately, Krishna wants me to do good in this world. Krishna wants us to come to him, like the river going toward the ocean. The river, when it is going on the way toward the ocean, it also does good to people along. So like that, with our abilities, Krishna wants us to do good in the world. Do good in the world. But then Krishna wants us also to come to him. So if we spend some time practicing our bhakti to sadhana to connect with Krishna, then that Krishna who has given us that ability and that interest, that Krishna can give it more to us. That Krishna can also give us more opportunities to use those abilities and interests and to reap more rewards. So like that, you can see the opportunities as coming from Krishna, who is also the source of future opportunities. And that way the present and future connections, sorry, the, our present interests and our ultimate interests, we can link them together. Okay. One more question. Like in the morning, I explained that uh, while dealing with urges or temptations, you have asked us to like uh, uh, to have formula, accuracy and uh, persistence. Hmm. So can we do a similar thing in like here also by dealing with modes? Yeah, definitely. Because that is a broad formula for managing the mind. And we, don't get, we have to manage the mind with respect to desires. We also just manage the mind with respect to the modes. So, so for example, that same being like an umpire. You know, just because somebody appeals loudly doesn't mean that we are going to listen to that. So we have to abstain. And we keep doing the right thing. Sometimes some umpires are hated by the players. Because you never listen to my appeal. But still, the umpire keeps doing the right thing. And then, after some time, the players will realize, you know, okay, it is not as umpire just goes against my appeals all the time. You know, when the appeal was against me also, the umpire was fair. Then gradually, the players will start saying that, okay, we are hating the umpire, we don't have to hate this umpire. As well, transcendence will come. So, that's, that's a valid mode of doing things. Okay. We'll have one last question, and then we'll continue. To, uh, we'll have a question answer session tomorrow also. At that time, we can discuss more. You told that mode of nature is like a set of forces uh, which uh, act internally and externally. Then, how it act externally, like some weight diamond that black object is in the mode of goodness or black, black color, or something external uh, tagline that this is the mode of goodness or ignorance? So Let's say, I'm not sure it can be that explicit to say that this color is necessarily in this mode. It could be, so that is subtle. I would say, uh, like broadly you can say like a bar or a brothel will be in the mode of ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a supermarket mall will be in the mode of passion. A library, a park, that could be broadly in the mode of goodness. A temple, you can say, is the mode of goodness is also in, in transcendence beyond it. So you can say some characteristics are there. We can just feel the effect just by going through the place. If you go close to nature, you go to an, uh, go by a river and just walk over there. You feel calmer. So yes, there are certain things which are in sattva, but whether you can specifically say that you know, say so this color is always in this mode. Falina Parishate also is there. What is the kind of effect that it has on purpose? So the modes, when we talk about externals, the modes associated with externals, there is both an objective and a subjective side to it. Objective means that that particular place is in a particular mode. But subjective means that it is depends on the individual. Like I have a friend who is a librarian in one of the Ivy League universities. He told me that you know the library is the place of Rajaguna for me. Why? Because mm -hmm. everywhere I want to take this book and I want to this register this book. Where can he find this book? Where can he find this? Book? He has to be busy. That's the Karma Kshetra. That's not the place where the person can be peaceful in Sattva Sattva Guna. 
Now, of course, you can say still working in the library will be more sattvic even for that person than if they work in some supermarket mall, isn't it? So, creatively speaking, you can, it is like sattva, but for that person, it is rajasic. So, there is the objective and subjective aspect both to it. So, rather than categorically deciding that say, if somebody says a particular color is in particular mode, then should we all surround everything around us in that color only? Well, that is not to say that will make us a hathvik automatic. It is not that simplistic. So, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Thank you.